to the unit on printing techniques. This unit introduces skills needed for the process of printing. Students will learn printing techniques through a combination of textual content and drawings. By the end of this unit, students will be able to identify the materials and tools required for printing and describe the basic printing techniques. Block printing is the process of transferring color, pattern, motifs or decorations to fabric. This can be done using one or more colors in any one of a variety of methods or techniques. It involves the surface application of color in a predetermined pattern, design or motif by manual or mechanical direct or resist methods. Colorants used in printing contain dyes thickened thicken to prevent the color from spreading by capillary action beyond the limits of the pattern or design. In printing, wooden blocks, stencils, engraved plates, rollers, screens, transfers and digital printing methods can be used for employing colors on the fabric. Traditional textile printing techniques may be broadly categorized into four styles. In the direct printing style, Colorants containing dyes, thickeners and mordants or substances necessary for fixing the color on the cloth are printed in the desired pattern. In the mordant style, a mordant is printed in the desired pattern prior to dyeing the cloth. The color adheres only where the mordant was printed. In the resist dyeing style, a resist substance is applied onto the fabric that is subsequently dyed. The resist areas do not accept the dye, leaving uncolored patterns against a colored ground. In the discharge printing style, a bleaching agent is printed onto previously dyed fabrics to remove some or entire color. Resist and discharge techniques were particularly fashionable in the 19th century, as were combination techniques in which indigo resist was used to create blue backgrounds prior to block printing of other colors. Modern industrial printing mainly uses direct printing techniques. There are several distinct methods at present in use for producing colored patterns on cloth such as hand block printing, perotene printing, engraved copper plate printing, roller printing, cylinder printing or machine printing, stencil printing, screen printing, transfer printing, electrostatic printing, photo printing and digital textile printing. Wood block printing on textiles is the process of printing patterns on textiles usually of linen, cotton or silk by means of incised wooden blocks. It is the earliest, simplest and slowest of all methods of textile printing. Block printing by hand is a very slow process. It is, however, capable of yielding highly artistic results, some of which are unobtainable by any other method. This is a wood block used for textile printing. The word printing implies a process that uses pressure, being derived from a Latin word meaning pressing. The German word Druck for print also means pressure. And there is no doubt that the first textile printing technique that is making impressions was using blocks with raised printing surfaces which were inked and then pressed onto the fabric. By repetition, the image from a single block builds up into a complete design over the fabric area. Some early blocks were made of clay or terracotta while others were made of carved wood. Wooden blocks carrying design motifs were found in tombs near the ancient town of Panopolis in Upper Egypt. The realization that certain colorless materials could be used as mordants to fix dyes extracted from plants and minerals 
and the discovery that different mordants applied first gave different colors with the same dye was a vital step in the prehistory of dyeing and printing. Where this style of printing originated, whether in India, Egypt, China or elsewhere is not clear. Experts state that an early variety of cotton dyed with madder around 3000 BC was found in jars in the Indus Valley. Evidences of madder dyed flax fabric were also found in Egypt dating to 1400 BC. In China, the dyeing of silk was developed very early and China is credited with the invention of paper printing and therefore it may have been the birthplace of fabric printing. A stencil is a thin sheet of material such as paper, plastic, wood or metal with letters or a design cut from it. This is used to produce the letters or design on an underlying surface by applying color through the cutout holes in the material. The key advantage of a stencil is that it can be reused to repeatedly and rapidly produce the same design. The design produced with a stencil is also called a stencil. Painting stencils can be made for one time use. Typically, they are made with the intention of being reused. To be reusable, they must remain intact after a design is produced and the stencil is removed from the work surface. Stencil paintings of hands were common throughout the prehistoric period. Stencils may have been used to color cloth for a very long time. The technique probably reached its peak of sophistication in Katazome and other techniques used on silks for clothes during the Edo period in Japan. The earliest use of stencil was found in Japan from 8th century. The early stencils were fragile and broke easily. Therefore, most of the early stencil designs were bold and clumsy. The Japanese transformed stenciling into an art form known as katazome. In this technique, sets of identical stencil are cut with a long thin knife from paper made from waterproofed mulberry fiber. One sheet is brushed with adhesive and silk threads or strands of hair are glued on in several directions like a net. A second sheet is then glued on top. Color is then applied through the stencil with a soft brush. Some of the most sophisticated stencils are thus made in Japan. In Europe, from, from about 1450, they were commonly used to color old master prints printed in black and white, usually woodcuts. This was especially the case with playing cards, which continued to be colored by stencil long after most other subjects for prints were left in black and white. Stencils were used for mass publications as the type did not have to be handwritten. The tools used for printing are printing surface such as a table, pearl pins, pigment colors, binder and fixer and containers to mix the pigment and binder. The tools used for block printing are wooden blocks, block printing tray, metallic mesh, foam sheet, muslin fabric, newspapers and pre-washed fabric pieces. The tools used for stencil printing are plastic sheet to cut out the stencil, pencil or pen for tracing the design, a duct tape, stencil cutter or knife, cutting mat or piece of glass, thick brush for or foam brush, sponge, pre-washed fabric piece, polyurethane or acrylic sprayer and newspapers. This module gives an overview of the block printing technique. The process of block printing begins with the wooden blocks. Wood carvers cut designs into blocks of different shapes and sizes in which the portions to be printed are carved or raised in relief. The top of the block has a handle for the printers to grasp. Each block has two or three cylindrical holes through it to permit the passage of air and to allow excess dye to squeeze out. 
There are also various points carved into the block which the printers use as placement indicators as they pick the block up and move it to the next patch of fabric. The blocks used for block printing can be made up of different types of wood, metal, linoleum, etc. Designs on wooden blocks with very fine lines which are not possible to be carved are made by inserting pieces of copper strips. The number of blocks required for printing depend on, on, the, on the number of shades in the designs. Yes. The pigment printing process consists of six steps. These are displayed here. We will look at each step in detail. The pigment printing process consists of pre-treatments followed by block or stencil printing, followed by drying, then further drying, followed by curing, rinsing, which is the last step. Prior to the printing process, bleached fabric may be sourced readily from the market. One needs to ensure that no surface impurities or starch remain on the fabric as starched fabric cannot absorb the dyes properly. Any existing starch on the fabric may be removed by thorough washing. The next step is to prepare the printing surface, that is the table consisting of three layers, foundation, padding and cover cloth. This is the table surface or wooden board. Padding can be done by spreading multiple layers of felt, jute, old woolen blanket etc to a thickness of an inch. The cover cloth over the padding can be secured to the underside of the board or the table by using smooth cotton muslin or light canvas fabric. This picture shows the setting up of the printing table. The next part of block printing is the preparation of the printing paste which comprises of the following activities. For block and stencil printing, pigments are used as colouring substances. This is the film forming material which forms the bond between the pigment and the fabric. Thickeners are used in the form of emulsion that give a thickness to the pigments. This can then be easily applied to the fabric surface. There are catalysts and cross-linking agents that help in printing process. To prepare the printing paste, a binder emulsion is first prepared and later mixed with the pigment. This paste is then used for printing. The table displayed here shows the recipe for binder emulsion. This table gives a recipe for printing. More binder can be added to the above paste as required. Pre-mixed binder emulsion is also available in the market which can be directly mixed with pigments and fixer as per the printing recipe. In the next stage, the fabric to be printed should be ironed and tightly stretched on the printing surface and can be secured in place by pins. Areas to be printed are marked with the help of fugitive color and measuring tape or scale. Proper gaps or seam allowances should be left for cutting and stitching. A printing tray is required to be prepared prior to beginning the process of printing. It helps to keep the printing paste evenly distributed on the surface of the block. The printing tray is a rectangular wooden or plastic trough. The first layer in the tray is a metal mesh. It is followed by a thick layer of woolen felt or foam sheet. This is then covered with a thin muslin cloth. The color is spread on this upper layer with the help of a small stiff piece of cardboard, metal or plastic. The block should be carefully pressed on the printing tray with even pressure so that it may pick up a uniform layer of printing paste. The block is then stamped on the stretched cloth by giving blows with the fist on the back of the handle to ensure a clear impression of the design. The printing of the design should be carried out 
either from left to right or vice versa or as per the layout of the design to be imprinted. A separate printing tray is required for each color of the design. The block is stamped repeatedly to build up the pattern or design and the process is carried out until all the colors are separately applied. Finally, a second application of color is done. After printing, the fabric is left for atmospheric drying. The freshly printed fabric should be handled with care so that the impressions are not transferred to other areas of the fabric. Next, the fabric should be heat set at a temperature of 90 to 100 degrees Celsius. This can be done with a dry iron or heat press, pressing the printed fabric from the reverse side for 2 to 5 minutes. Move the iron to avoid scorching. This is followed by curing, which is done in a curing chamber at a temperature of 140 degrees Celsius for 5 minutes. Alternately, Curing treatment for the fabric can be done in a dry oven for which loosely rolled fabric may be wrapped in an unprinted newspaper, newsprint paper for 2 to 3 minutes at 170 degrees to 180 degrees Celsius. If required, this may be followed by rinsing the fabric in a neutral detergent. Chop chop. Oh, it's an overprint. You must have registration marks on there somewhere. I got to know. I got it. Yeah, that's how that's how printing how printing press works the same way. You have four colors. So today I have these really nice looking wooden blocks with me and uh, I'll be telling you how to print using these wooden blocks. This is traditional Indian style booty. Uh, we call it booty because uh, in Hindi booty means um, a pattern. So this is Indian booty and uh, this these are new blocks so the, these have not been used ever. So these have uh, some white color on it and uh, as i use it it will turn uh, of a different color so you must also keep some um, waste towels and uh, tissue papers or things because uh, you may have to wipe your hands time to time so i'll keep them aside and uh, this is the color that i have made using yellow and red color and water based binder and also I have added about uh, four to five drops of color fixer to it. So at this point you may want to use gloves because this is all chemical. This is not organic substance. This is all chemical and ke chemical might be injurious for your hands. Now I will tell you how to make the bed. This is a waste fabric that I am going to use. 
um, this one is a this one I have cut from a from an old t-shirt which was not in use so I have kept I, I am nicely you know spreading it on a on this waist uh, fabric that I've showed this is pretty thick this has become pretty thick now and uh, it's good for printing so this is my uh, two layered you know bed for printing it is good to have a lot of layers oh yes i forgot to tell you before that before you start printing you must uh, you know be ready with the a couple of things first one is uh, a thing like this uh, actually i'm kind of very experimentative so what i have done i have taken a wooden coaster and on which i have kept uh, i glued uh, this thing um, you can say it's, it's a sponge this is actually a felt piece see it is properly glued this one i'll be using to put uh, you know color on it so yeah so this is ready i'll put color on it now and you will you need to use a squeezy squeezy if you want to know about the squeezy you must watch my another video on which i have talked about it right now i'm using an old card from a shopping mall as squeezy to apply the color squeezy is nothing but uh, an applicator to put the color so i am keeping that aside so what i'll do i'm going to try how it prints maintain the consistency otherwise so this is what i have done you see the color is on the block now i will try to print some this is the waist cloth so i'll try to print here like this press it nicely and let's see what happens okay it is pretty perfect yeah it looks nice lovely so guys this is my uh, final fabric uh, ready for printing i have spread it nicely over the layer or the bed that i have made for printing that is two layered bed that i am using for printing i want to tell you about uh, you know the thickness of the layers you must you know you must keep it thick because uh, it it gives a nice texture to the print if the layers you know the bed is thick so uh, just wanted to show you nicely that my you know the fabric is ready for printing it has little bit uh, you know shrinkage that won't you know affect the printing much yes so at this point i'll be using scale to measure so guys i'm gonna start printing now i'll take the color from here this is the color i'll start here nicely i will press it so the impression is nice so you see i've already started so i'm gonna you know i'll make the space between the patterns about five inches away it's up to you but i like uh, my pattern a little far from each other so again i'll repeat the process and uh, the height that i'm taking is about five inches again this is the midpoint from the bottom I have left a little margin here so I am counting from here so it's 5 inches height again and I am going to print it alternatively like uh, you see this here yeah I will repeat the process don't get bored stay with me till the end and we'll have a lovely lovely print so i'm almost done and this looks really really pretty the booties are very you know far away and uh, at this point if you think that um, the spacing is not correct uh, you can use another block to fill in the space this is what i think the blocks right now are little far away from each other i'm taking second block for printing it looks lovely i'm going to print it uh, for my cushion covers so this kind of placement works for me so i'm almost done here it looks like a very very pretty block printed fabric now and i bet it will be beautiful after i sew it so here i'm done you see 
it's nice right you must be looking at these this you know extra color that has come so don't worry about that it will go off when we wash the fabric for the first time so this is it uh, and uh, next time we will be printing using uh, you know one screen again and uh, screen printing is very you know quick and easy and uh, i will tell you how to print using screen although i have told you in a video before but i'll tell you again in next uh, one more video i'll you know publish about um, how to treat this fabric to make it color fast so all ये करा है ना तो इसमें ये हॉल हॉल ज्यादा
Will you ask him for me? Yes. Suresh, please. Why he always does it from the same side of the table? Sam? He always does it from the same side of the table. He doesn't go around that side. Okay. Why? 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 So he can't get too fat like me because he wouldn't be able to reach. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, pretty clever, isn't it? Amazing. You feel me? Can I get around this? ये बना ये तो पड़ा रहता है कंपनी चला जाएगा फिर सम पुट इन सम पाउडर और समथिंग देन अनदर वाटर 2 3 4 टाइम दिस विल बी वॉश इज इट ट्रेस द शेप ऑफ ईच ब्लॉक ऑन टू योर फोम शीट कट आउट द फोम शेप्स and glue the pieces of foam to the wood block. If you have spray adhesive, this works really great. Trace the shape of your wood block to create reference marks on your printed out image. Now, take a sheet of tracing paper and place it over the printed image, lining it up with the reference marks. Copy the marks onto the tracing paper. Now take a marker and fill in the dark areas of the image. I'm creating a border for this print. Reposition your tracing paper and copy the reference marks again. Using a marker, fill in all the colored area of the image. Now, cut out the two pieces of tracing paper. Flip the tracing paper over so that it creates a mirror image on your block. Spread glue onto one of the blocks. Carefully lay the tracing paper onto the wet block. Now, spread glue onto the other block and carefully place the remaining piece of tracing paper. Allow the glue to dry completely for this next step, you will need a razor sharp knife, so be very careful. Carefully cut along the lines of your image. Gently peel away the excess foam. Be very careful when removing pieces of foam in detailed areas. The more detailed the image, the more difficult this part of the process will be. Be very careful when removing pieces of foam around delicate areas of the image. Divide complex areas into more basic shapes. This makes removing the foam much easier. Once all the cutting has been completed, Remove the layer of tracing paper by wetting it with water. After a few minutes, the paper should easily come off. 
clean off any excess glue. Now we are ready to make our first print. You will need a paint palette. I'm using palette paper. And for the print, I will use watercolor paper. Position your wood block on the paper and make reference marks at the corners. We will start with the color plate first. For this project, I'm using acrylic paint. Using an ink roller, mix the paint on the palette. Roll an even layer of paint onto the first block. Carefully line up your wood block to the reference marks on the paper. Now, flip your paper over. Be careful to keep the wood block from slipping. Using the back of a spoon, apply pressure over the raised area of the wood block. Wipe off any excess paint from the wood block. Now put some black paint on your palette. Use your ink roller to fully cover the second wood block. Now that you have learned the process of block printing, the final module will give you an overview of the stencil printing technique. There are five steps in the process of stencil printing. Preparing the stencils, drawing the design, carving out the shapes, creating bridges and sealing the stencil. The process of stencil printing begins with the preparation of stencils. Stencils are made by cutting out shapes or designs from a flat sheet of stiff paper or stiff plastic sheet with a sharp pointed knife. Trace or draw the design on the stencil material using a marker or pen. The design should be carefully planned ensuring that all sections of the image remain joined by bridges. Use a sharp knife or cutter to carve out the shapes in the stencil over a cutting mat. Any shape, if cut out completely from the stencil, would fall out of the pattern, leaving a spot or gap. To prevent this, some form of a tie is used to link the shape to the main design on the stencil. The outlines of the shapes are therefore broken at convenient points by cutting the stencil partially. This uncut portion serves as a tie to support the inside parts. These ties are commonly known as bridges. The bridges or connecting areas in the stencil may be reinforced by a packing tape or duct tape. Silvers of tape can be used on both sides of the stencil to strengthen thinner shapes in the designs as well as to repair any mistakes. The cutout design will be the positive printed shape. After completing the cutout on the stencil, it is important to further reinforce and seal the stencil by spraying it with commercially available acrylic or polymeric sprays. This sealing protects the stencil from dampness during the application and cleaning process. After assembling all the materials, one can start printing using a stencil. The fabric to be printed should be free from creases and should be stretched out on a printing surface. The pretreatment and the preparation of printing paste remains the same as for block printing. The preparation of printing paste for stenciling is the same as for block printing. It may be poured into a shallow container and can be applied to the fabric through the stencil using a foam brush. One needs to ensure that the brush is not overloaded with paste. The brush may be daubed repeatedly up and down in the container to ensure the even coating of the brush surface with the paste. The application of the brush should begin from the middle of the stencil in the largest cutout area. The brush should not be glided in the open areas of the stencil as it leads to seeping of the print paste under the edges. Thus, instead of one single application, several coats should be made to develop the design 
since a relatively dry application ensures better print. After applying color to all areas, the stencil may be peeled off starting from one corner. The stencil must be cleaned after three to four applications by a sponge. The post printing process to be followed should be the same as described in block printing. Welcome to PrintCutSew.com. I'm Michelle and I'm going to lead you through this easy paper stencil silkscreen tutorial. What you'll need to get started is a silkscreen frame, pigment ink, some orange and some blue, spatula, squeegee, some fabric, masking tape and scotch tape, a 16th hole punch, scissors, and an X-Acto knife. So one thing I'm going to want to do is, because there are some smaller de delicate areas in this stencil that I've developed, um, I'm going to want to just put some scotch tape right over them. So give it a little bit more strength, but it'll still make it really easy to cut out. If you want to make your own stencils at home, the one thing you need to remember is that the white area that you don't cut out needs to be a continuous piece of white. You don't want any um, pieces that are going to fall out. So we're going to start cutting out the black, and like I said, we're going to start cutting out the very small areas. Last thing I want to do is take the 16th punch and go right into the corners here and here. So now we have stencil number one for the blue layer. It's all cut out, ready to go. We'll just put it aside and then we'll do the orange. You also want it to kind of center in your screen, line it up line on the back of the silk screen, but you want to leave a significant area at the bottom, at least two, three inches. This is the area we'll call the well. Now I laid my first fabric panel down and I've marked where I want the top to be and I've put it in line with my center line. I've smoothed it out. My next step is just to lay the silk screen with the stencil laid tape to it. And we're just going to generally line up the lines and I've marked where I want the bottom to be so that the stencil is printed in the part of the in the part of the panel that I'd like it to be on. So, I only have about two inches around. I don't want to print any more around there. I'm going to be careful just to get it. <clears throat> I'm going to put down a fair bit of pigment. You're squeegeeing the pigment. called one pass. So we're going to do four passes with medium to hard pressure, keeping an angle the whole time. Now when we lift off, we lift off one side and then the other. There you have your silk screen. Orange transparent pigment. Now 
Um, you can uh, squeegee um, the ink either by pu pushing or by pulling. Uh, different people prefer different ways. This would be a pull. But many people feel this is really So you lift up one side to the other. There you go. You can see where the orange and the blue have mixed. They made the third. So let's get started with the printing. I have some basic materials here, some stencils and paints and a sponge for printing. It's all pretty available and I love the Jacquard Lumiere, Neopaque and Textile colors for the stenciling. It's just the right consistency for what I want. So let me show you how I make my sponge. Here's one of my sponges made up. I want to make it into a little, a little dauber. So I'm taking a piece of dense foam like this I'm folding it up into uh, so I get a nice printing surface out of that, that, that spot in the center. And then I'm taking a rubber band and I'm going to wind that around that back side so that it makes it easier to hold while I'm doing the printing. That way I can make several and print with different colors and set them down and not have them pop open as I'm working. So that's what I'm going to be printing with. Now it's important that you print with something like this. You don't want to be printing with a sponge, like a makeup sponge or other piece of foam, where you're just trying to dab a small amount of paint off the corner. That's too much paint and not really directing it where you want. So you're going to get a nice soft airbrush effect out of making a little dauber like this. So as you can see, I have a very small amount of paint on the surface of my plate here. And I'm going to start with that. You can always take more. and You'll have a different hand than I will, but this will give you an idea of the quantity of paint that, that you need to be working with. So when you start the printing, you want to work on either a plastic surface or something with a, a little bit of padding. So I'm on a, um, a fabric surface with a little piece of plastic over the top. And as you can see, I also have a light and a dark piece of fabric. So I find if I print on a light one and a dark one, with the same paint at the same time, I'm going to like one more than the other. I have several samples here on the wall where you can see here's the same image printed on a light piece, a dark bumpy piece, and another textured piece. You can see that same turtle image is very different on the three pieces of fabric. So it's a great idea to start with several pieces just to see what you're going to like as you start putting the paint to the fabric. Let me show you how to get a great print with your stencil. One of the keys is to use a small amount of paint. It's really important to work with a dry sponge. Touch into the paint, dab it around on the plate before you go to the stencil. You don't want to dab into the paint and take a large amount of paint and go straight to the stencil because you get a big blob there and you can't get it smooth. So you touch into the paint and you work it around on the plate first until you get a nice smooth surface and application of the paint. Then you go to the printing surface. So when I come to the stencil, I can dab, I can brush, and I can hold the stencil and I can lift it up and see how the printing is going and I can drop the stencil back down and keep printing. I can also add another color. So at this stage of the game, if I want to take, say, another color and add it to it, I can touch in and I can go back and I can add another color to this same stencil and see what would happen when I lift that up. So you can see that's really changed the surface. And I'm just holding the stencil in one position and lifting up that corner just to see what I'm getting. Let me show you how different this is going to look on a lighter piece of fabric. So if I move the stencil over onto the muslin, it's a different texture. This dark texture has a little bit of a rib in there, which is making a texture on the printed surface. So when I come over to the linen, to the muslin, I also have um, a different way I can work on that because it's a smooth surface. So you can see when I pull that back, it's different already just because of the surface of the fabric is so smooth. So I can use the same amount of paint I have in there, which is still quite enough, and I might decide that I want to print 
just those little corner pieces in several places on my fabric. I can also go back, lay it on that first one, and again, add a second color. If you don't have a lot of experience with mixing colors, a great way to learn about that is to just let the colors mix themselves. So you can work with the same sponge and pull several colors in at the same time and get the stencil to look quite interesting even if you don't feel like you have the background to be mixing color. So I can go in and I can put two or three different colors across this stencil to get it to look a little bit different each time I print. So that's really the secret to getting a great stencil design is not a lot of paint. One of the things I like to do with the stencils to get a little more depth and dimension in the printing is to print things so they look like they're coming behind other things or weaving into other shapes. So you can see this border design here. If I decide I want to print that and have it look like it's going behind this plant shape I've already printed, I can lay that onto the top of the plant shape and I like to use post-its. So I've got this little post-its here and I'm printing off the place where I don't want it to show and I'm going to now print just one end and maybe lightly, I, I don't know, until I pick this up but I can print one end of the stencil pick it up and see how, see how it's working take the post-its off and I can print from the other end. Now, there are several ways to do this. Now on this side I printed so that it stops right at the edge of my shape as you can see my first design I printed. But I can also print and fade out. That's another technique if you don't have post-its or you don't want it to be very specific. You can also just have it fade out as it gets to the edge of the shape. And you can see that gives a very different look to that piece as it goes underneath. You see the outside design a lot more. So that's a really fun trick to be able to get those stencils to overlap one another. You can also put stencils inside of each other. So as I'm looking at this great big open shape here and this wonderful plant shape I already had, I'm going to lay this right over the top and I'm going to print just the outside edge just to give myself a little bit of a frame for that shape I've already got. So what happens is that original stencil becomes surface design in the second stencil that you create. So you can see as I lift that up, that second image becomes a layer on that bigger shape that I've created by laying the second stencil on top. We're going to do some layering in some different ways um, and I've got some examples of that that I can share with you and as I lay this back down I realize it would look more interesting if I had a little more paint just on the edges and boy with this color you can really see the texture of the fabric. You can see those vertical lines in the, you know, diagonally now crossing my design and that's coming from the texture in the fabric. So it's very fun to use something like poplin or a hand woven or something that's nubby and that gives a very different look than the smooth surface of the uh, muslin type fabric. This cactus floral stencil has a lot of different design elements in, in it and some of them are fairly unexpected. Here's a little quilt square I printed with design images from this stencil. And one of the ones you wouldn't expect might be this little kind of mark I placed, the black mark in the center. That's actually the center from this flower right here. And on the stencil it appears like this. Let me show you how I just print that one little detail. I've taken some post-its and masked off that little area that I want to print. And if I just take a little bit of paint and dab it over here, you can actually see where that shape came from in the center, that little center design. There's that little design element just from the center of that piece. So any of the elements in this stencil could be isolated and used independently. Like these little triangles are very nice too. I have a collection of fabrics I'd like to show you that are printed just from this one stencil. This will give you an idea about how versatile each stencil image is, each collection of shapes that you have to work with. So here's the stencil design and a collection of shapes that 
have been printed just using this one design. As you can see, they all look like they could be quilt squares, which might inspire a great project. So this, this border design, as you can see, has been used to come all the way into the corner and then run out the side on this um, gridded fabric. And I've used a little bit of the top of this plant shape here. Just You can see not using the whole stencil is sometimes more interesting. I love the dark on the tips with this kind of apricot color and that's this um, big cactus flower shape printed one time and then I printed that same flower shape four times around in a in a square to make the centerpiece of this particular shape and then use that same little curving leaf or um, flower petal shape to come out and spin around the outside edge and the border on this one has been used just as one piece in the center of the design. This outside um, shape or bigger leaf or petal shape has been used just by itself to make these sort of marching progressive uh, cloud-like printings on this piece which is very different looking. Adding a little bit of white to that has given me um, a little brighter green on that dark blue fabric so that would have started out just like that white printing and then the green put back on top. Um, these edges of the flower have been used around the edge of this little quilt square right here as well as the whole flower with a little bit of green at the base for the pieces for the symmetrical corners. I like this one a lot with the blue with the, the kind of ghost-like printed shape and then back into this yellow color here. I've used just half the leaf here. You can see this shape here is this shape here. This little piece look like little toes coming out are actually the tips on this. So you can see just from this little collection right here how versatile one stencil can be and I haven't done anything else to it um, like beading or stitching or trapunto or, or piping or making it into a little bag or a pocket on a great jacket. Those are the next stages of how to use the designs. But right now, we're going to play with some of the possibilities of things you can get with just one stencil design. This piece of silk organza has been printed with this eucalyptus leaf stencil design. And you can see on the sheer fabric, it has this whole other potential because I can layer it over the top of another piece of fabric. So putting it over this bright green color, I get one look out of the stencil. And you can see how very different it is when I layer it over something like this grid fabric. Or I could layer it over even another print. That's what's happening as you look at this design right here. This design was printed with the same eucalyptus leaf stencil. I've printed the commercial quilting cotton which has a green um, line design on the back. I've printed those big leaves, those big green leaves, on that print first. Then on this top layer, which is silk organza, I've printed these bug designs. So the bug designs are working like the leaves on this shear as an overlay on top of the leaves. So I've put them down and then I've wrinkled the fabric for a little more interest and I've used the buttons as a surface design and I've made myself a small sample which now allows me to play with this idea for a potential um, uh, sewing project. Okay, this is a great trick. You're going to love this. Notice how I've printed these leaf designs so they look like they're floating behind parts of the striped fabric. Well, let me show you how I make that happen. Pretty easy, actually. I take my masking tape and I cut myself some little strips the size of the stripes. So I've got some little strips right here. And I put those strips down covering the tape covering the stripe I want to cover. You put the masking tape down first and then you just print over the top of the masking tape. So if I take my stencil design and I place it over the, the tape and the fabric at the same time and I print, remember you're pounding pretty firmly with a small amount of paint, way better than a lot of painting. 
trying to dab it on. So once I print, you can see there's a nice leaf print there now, and I peel the tape off, I now have that leaf floating behind the stripe. Look at how beautifully these copper leaves have been folded into the surface design on this piece of round batik fabric. I've added the copper leaves, and you can see what makes them look like they're integrated into the design is that I haven't printed the whole leaf solid anywhere. Now let me show you how that works. Here's a piece of batik fabric right here, and I'm going to add this leaf behind some of those images that are already on the stencil. So I dab into my paint. And I can add a totally different color, but I kind of like the, I'm um, going with the coppers and the bronzes, which I think are going to be a nice combination with what's already there. So I can, remember we've got that technique with the, um, mat, with the post-its. We've got the technique we can use with the post-its, but we can also just print in a really light way and have it float behind the object which I think is a beautiful technique. The other thing that I sometimes will do is once I get that initial object, I find that the piece of fabric sort of invites some kind of other shape to kind of tie the pieces together. So I find that oftentimes I'll go back with just a small amount of paint and maybe one little bit of a shape or a piece that the stencil has to offer and go back and add some more of that image um, as well. But you can see how lovely that leaf is added to that stencil design. One of the ways to use your favorite stencil designs is for an all-over background or a very subtle kind of ghost printing. And a lot of the images will really lend themselves to that. I'm going to use the texture and the inside shape on this leaf on the spring leaf stencil to show you what I mean to illustrate this concept. So if I take a small amount of paint, and I'm pretty close to the color of the background. In other words, I'm using a dark color on a dark fabric, so it's not going to show up a lot. But you see how beautiful that printing is? Now I can continue, without being too concerned about the edges, I can continue to move this around and do basically a background printing with this stencil design. You can see how I'm getting an all-over print. And when you're printing with the right amount of paint, there's hardly any there. I can touch this now, and none of it is coming off on my hands. If the stencil design is held together well, you can also slightly rub the surface of the stencil and not be concerned about lifting up parts of the design. But they don't all work like that, so you need to notice your design and you need to look at your stencil design before you start to make sure that it's not going to lift up some of the design elements. But you can see what a beautiful background that makes. Now I can go over the top of that with something more dramatic and add another stencil image to that. So if I was to take another color and do something that will show up a little more, I can go back over the top and print on top of that, treating that original printing like a background. So basically I'm making my own background first and then I'm printing over the top and you can see what a lovely effect that is over the top of that printed surface. Things I haven't talked about is how much how you print has to do with the design. Now, if I was to take this one leaf right here, I could print this one leaf like that. Look at how interesting that is. I could print that one leaf by scrunching and maybe just printing part of it. I could also print that one leaf just by lightly dragging a little bit of the sponge across the leaf. So I get a slight drag mark in the design as I'm printing because I'm dragging the stencil. So you can see how much more interesting the printing is when you play with how you print. So you want to print with a firm hand, with a nice even hand, and work with different colors at the same time, because that's really what's going to make your stenciling more interesting. 
If you have a design where you want to reverse the image and flip the image, you can do that really easily with a stencil. So this is a stencil called Wings, and you can see they're half of wing shapes, mostly halves. And so if I was to print, say, half of this shape, print the whole shape and then flip it over for the other half, I could get um, a butterfly shape to happen. So what I would want to do is print it once. Wow, it's beautiful on that dark fabric, isn't it? So after I do the first print, I'm just going to take and lightly with a clean sponge wipe off any excess paint. I can also blot it with a paper towel. There's not that much paint there, so it's not going to come off, but I want to make sure that when I lay this down the second time and I flip it over, it's not going to get paint on my fabric. You can see now when I flip it over, I can see the other image through there, so it helps me to line this up. So I can totally make a really beautiful symmetrical image out of this one stencil design. So any of the images would work that way, um, even if it doesn't suggest that to you, like a wing maybe suggests you should have two, one on each side, but any image can do that, you know, a leaf, a flower, uh, any image that you have that you like could, could work that way. So let's print something that isn't an obvious flip over half um, looking design to start with, and let's just print it in, in a couple of different ways. So here's a leaf shape, and if I print one of them, and I pick that up. I have to tell you, one of the things I do if I feel like there's too much paint is I use the heel of my hand and I go like that and I lift up. If there's like an extra little blob somewhere, I'll pick it up on that heel of my hand and it, and it works really well. So now I'm going to wipe this off and flip it over and let's see what we get if we just print it. Kind of slightly overlapping. So that's what makes a really pretty shape. The shapes can also kind of roll into each other. So here's a really great shape. Some things that aren't borders can make borders. Like here's a, here's a really beautiful shape right here. And I can take this and I can make this weave itself back together and create a movement design out of just that one shape. So you can see how that's you know, one is kind of folding into, into the other, and I could even continue, I could continue it overlapping this way, which is kind of interesting. See, it's great that the stencils are slightly see-through. It's a mylar that's see-through so that you can actually see what's happening with your design. So the design can work that way, and it could also cross and continue to make a shape and, and slightly turn and go off in another direction. I always play on scraps of fabric or um, extra pieces rather than my finished project because the surprises are how the stencil will move. I might want a border design but realize when I link these together they make a curve which I hadn't expected and I may want to use that in my design. So I always want to play somewhere so I can see what will the design do, what are the possibilities, so that as I get to my finished piece, I have more options. I'm also feeling like this one would be really lovely to add a little spark to of another shape that maybe plays and, and kind of comes in and out of what I already have there. So this is when I might use a second color or you know, flip a little piece over and go back and forth with, with another image. I want to show you how to print this really beautiful multi-tone effect with your stencil where you're basically laying one stencil down and printing multiple colors at the same time. So this is a great example of that particular technique. I'm going to be printing on this silk organza and because it's so sheer, whenever you print on something really sheer you need another layer of fabric or a paper towel underneath it because the paint basically goes through and stains that top layer and if it's plastic it will just make a bad um, print. So I want something to absorb the paint on the other side. So I'm going to take this nice little border here and I'm going to do it with several colors. And I'm not really going for the colors to mix but I'm just going to print along one edge of the stencil with each color. So I'm printing one edge, and I think I'm going to take a, a second sponge, and then 
then I'm going to print the other edge with a totally different color. Now I can leave the center kind of unblended or unmixed and you can see on this textured fabric it leaves kind of a, a, a bumpy texture to the edge of the printing and I can also drop that back and go back and pick up a third color in the middle which I'm going to pick up sort of this metallic and see what happens down the center of this if I start to let those colors blend each other. But you can see the multicolor look um, where you print through several colors at one time on one stencil gives a really great effect. Let's take a minute and clean the stencil off. You want to do this pretty much right after your session so that the, the stencil stays crisp and you don't lose the design because the paint fills in the holes. So what I do is I take a little bit of, uh, I like the organic cleaners, the green cleaners, or the orange cleaners. You can also use any kind of antibacterial kitchen cleaner. If this paint has sat on the stencil for a long time, you could use acetone, like a fingernail polish remover, to get that hard stuff off. Um, so what I have in the pan is a little bit of water and some of the, some of the detergent type cleaner. And I'm going to take my stencil, I'm just going to lay it down there to soak for a few minutes. Since I'm doing this right after the printing session, I'm just going to let it sit for 10 or 15 minutes and then I'll be ready to clean it off. So it's been sitting for a few minutes and I'm going to take it out of the water. And I'm just going to lay it on the paper towel. And what I'm using is, I'm using a kitchen sponge that has that Teflon kind of a soft scrubber surface on it. And I like that for cleaning the stencils off. So I want to put a little bit of water on the, on the sponge, and I've got the paint side up on this piece of paper towel here, and all I'm going to do is lightly rub, and you want to kind of notice the direction of the design so that you're not lifting up any fragile parts. But as I do this, I'm just going to be lightly scrubbing the surfaces of the stencil, and you can see it comes off real easily. It actually makes a second stencil out of that paper towel if you've got any good ideas. Um, so I, I'm just going to move that around in the paper towel a little bit and use that scrubber. And if I've used both sides, I might need to flip it over. You can see that that kitchen scrubber works really well. And you can lightly go back and forth um, if the design allows. But that's taken all the paint off the surface. You're going to find that there might be a little bit of staining left on the surface. But for the most part, this will take off the, the, the bulk of the paint. Everyone. Today I'm going to be introducing a lino cutting to you. So the one I'm using right now is called Dela Lino Block. I got it from Hobby Crafts and this piece here was three pounds. Three pounds um, money. The size is about, I would say, 20 and a half centimeters by... 15 centimeters so I bought it off just like that now there's different types of lino but I'm not gonna go uh, through them today because I'm only working with the gray one which is the softer type lino and uh, to work with a lino you need a lino cutter and there's different nibs that goes in the tool so this one here is very useful when you make lines or you know you want to do some cross hatching and then you've got two different sizes here which can make holes or shapes on your lino and this one the V shape is the one that we use to carved to carve out lines so lino Lino is used in printmaking. Uh, the main principle of lino that you need to know is once you've carved your line out, you cannot put the lino back. And every carved line will expose the inside of the lino, which means when you apply your paint on top of it and when you print, wherever you have carved the lines out that will be the color of the paper if you print on white paper your carved outlines will be white on your paper if you print on yellow 
paper, the carved outlines will be yellow on your paper and so on and so forth. It's very difficult to understand this process unless you see it in action. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm using this as a reference picture to draw. If you don't feel comfortable drawing, you definitely can use your rubber stamp. Um, I'm just looking for a rubber stamp here. Use a rubber stamp and then uh, have a go at it. You can um, stamp your rubber stamp onto your lino and then start carving the outline. So when you carve these outlines here, which means when you print any color that you're going to be printing, all of the inside that you have not carved out will have the paint color. Um, onto your paper. So you can go ahead and have a play and definitely take um, your stamping a, a step ahead and um, you know change your design and so on and so forth. I'm going to be starting off with my liner over here. I'm deciding I think I'm gonna use the whole of this liner. So my um, what I would like to do with this picture here is to focus on the pattern on the scarf rather than on the face. So with the face, I want to leave it really plain. I don't even think I'm gonna put anything on the face uh, or if I do, just probably eyebrow and maybe the outline of the nose, the eyes with no details, maybe just the eyelashes and the um, maybe the lips, I don't know. It's not a realistic um, design that I'm doing here. It's to kind of like bounce off ideas from the main from this picture here as a source of inspiration to create a print okay let's get started i'm using this um kohinoor graphite pen uh, just because i find it really easy to sketch with it you can also use a 2b pencil uh, try not to use hb pencil because hb pencils are um the lead is quite hard and I don't I think it's not very easy to kind of like slide onto your lino when you're working and then you don't want to make too harsh a line so that if you make a mistake you can't go back and then rub it out I, that's why I think for me this is the easiest so I'm gonna go ahead and do that and then we're gonna look at um, the printing process
Okay, now it's a uh, decision dis decision making time. <clears throat> um, I need to decide right now which area I would like to um, keep white. I'm gonna be printing on white. So which section I would keep white? I forgot I had to work on this area here. So the shaded area will be um, area that I would like in color. I haven't decided in color. Even the picture is in black and white. I was debating whether I should keep it in black and white. Start with, you know, black and white, but um, I don't know. I just thought it would be fun to actually just go ahead and do some coloring in. I mean, not coloring in, I mean, uh, do some colors. I mean, it's a printmaking, you know, you can, you can do any color you like, really. So, um, here I am um, deciding that I think I'm going to have to carve out the face area because this is the area I would want to be the color of the paper, which means all of the, the, the nose and everything, the the eyebrows will be double, so the, the line for the nose has to, has, has to be double line, or carve these out so that they become the color of the paper. I'm not sure, so I think I'm going to start off by That's the hardest part with printmaking. Um, making decision. So, if I do an outline and then do a first print, then start with light color, maybe with a light, with a beige color. Or I could go pop -a and use like red, yellow, blue. That would be interesting. So start with yellow. So all, all of these will be yellow. And then... Okay, um, I'm just gonna get started here and then we'll take it from there, okay?
so what I have done here, I've just cut out, carved out the lines that define the main features, you know, of this um, design. And um, when I'm going to put paint on top of it, uh, whatever have been, has been carved out will not have the paint, therefore the carved out lines would be the um, color of the paper. I'm choosing to work on white paper so you can imagine if that was a, I don't know, let's say I was going to print yellow on red, the carved out lines then would be the, would be red and the yellow would be everything else so at the moment all these details will not be shown because working with lino is a step-by-step -step, um it's a step-by-step -step, uh, project and uh, there's many steps that you have to do before you get to the final one so at the moment i know eventually i would want to carve out everything the face will be carved out so that the face can be white and the rest can be, you know, other colors or whatever. But um, I would like to start off first with this very uh, minimum carve outlines and see what we get. And then uh, maybe do a second uh, uh, print but with more carving. So therefore, when uh, I print, I like to do maybe about five or maybe if I will do about four prints first because remember once I carved one you cut once you carved out the liner you can't put them back right it's a step that once you've done it this is it you can't get get it back on so if you have four um, prints then you can play around with them speedball one and this one it's uh, quite it's rubber and I wanted to use this one for with my jelly plate and this one um, I think it's a, it's a rubber as well but for some reason this one is softer when I'm pressing it I can feel it you know giving in going in but you can't see it on camera and this one is harder so when I'm gonna be applying my paper on top this would have paint on it so I'm gonna use a clean one to get a good impression and press this in so let's get started. Oh, I'm using which paper I'm using. I'm using this paper here just to show you. Uh, it's just plain photo paper. It's the matte one. I found that, that this pack of paper in uh, 99p shop. And um, I have been doing some printing on it. And for some reason, it prints really, really well. So I'm just using it. It's the F A420 GSM, if any one of you is wondering. Okay, let's get started then.
<coughs> excuse me uh, my hands gone really dirty I have uh, throughout this project there's so many moments I just wanted to give up um, first of all I had the uh, printing issue because the acrylic was drying too fast so really if you want to do be if you want to do a printing on lino I think the best paint to use is the printing uh, paint the, the special paint that you know you, you use with lino um, at school I was using the kind of like the polystyrene type and it's different from lino and I think the water-based paint or acrylic that I put on the polystyrene it has a different texture and uh, also it it gives me a bit of more time you know to print so but however I decided to use my stamping up because this is me I don't give up right um, I only ever give up is the if the subject matter itself has um, I'm not interested in the subject matter itself it's like if the subject matter is becoming boring or uh, you know is not um, the subject matter itself is not you know as exciting as making it then I give up but I love printing I love the whole kind of like step and then building up your prints so let me quickly very quickly just show you among all of these here as you know eventually the last step was when I removed the background this is why I started off with yellow because I wanted the face you know to have um, the yellow I was gonna carve out these first because then to have the color of the paper for the face and then I decided to um, change that um, if I have to go back now, because with my, if you look at my lino, I've carved the face out. That looks scary. Um, if I have to, because I've carved this out, then I can print on different tone paper. But that's that. And I've got a few prints so, so far. And then I need to trim it and then mount it. I think I actually quite like, um, and that's the picture, the picture of inspiration obviously when you when you draw and carve it um, turns the other way but hopefully you manage to understand the steps involved in uh, keeping the color that you want and then you know carving out step by step to get the design mm, like over here I have layered uh, two colors I don't know but anyway um, I quite like this one as well for some reason I do really like this one and then the second one I like is this I think I like this one the best this print here uh, I thought I've carved these out but it still shows it doesn't matter and now the next step I do not like this one looks like I've got some skin disease or something I don't know but um, I quite like that as well. But now my next step, when I have time, what I would like to do, use this print as a base and then start uh, painting. Uh, so it will be like a mixed media. The, the rest of it will, will be the print and just work on the face um, with acrylic. So I think that would be, <coughs> sorry. That would be an interesting project for me so for example this is what I'm talking about I'm gonna put the paint obviously not straight on the face I'm just doing that now just the paint underneath is still very the ink it's still very wet so I can't can't start working on it now but when it's completely dry oh that's the stamping up ink isn't it so I think I want to paint and just to kind of like get rid of that chicken pox skin that I have. Um, it doesn't have to be the beige color, so I actually quite like the blue. Reminds me of P Picasso. Oh yeah. So I think I need to work on it, let it dry, and then keep working on it. Do you see what I mean? 
so like the face will be painted you get the idea right and then obviously because I've got red orange I'm making the face as a blue I don't know but this is this is what I mean turn it into like a mixed media so I don't even know when I will have the time to do that because I want to put this away for the minute and when I do work like this here I have an album where I keep everything You have now reached the end of this unit. To summarize, in this unit, you learned about the two basic printing methods, block printing and stencil printing. Thank you.